in the 1980s, I worked on a film about Magnox. Magnox is a British nuclear power system of power stations and fuel reprocessing. One of the most interesting parts of Magnox was how it got the spent fuel rods from the nuclear power stations all over Britain back to Sellafield for reprocessing. This used a system of containers or flasks that ran on British Rail. These flasks were made out of a single billet of forged steel and they were tested using high-speed photography and a train crash. Here is a film about that testing. When nuclear fuel is sent from power stations to Sellafield in Cumbria for reprocessing, a simple procedure is used which has now been carried out safely more than 14,000 times. The fuel rods are first cooled for at least 90 days at the power station in dry storage or by immersing them in ponds. When they're taken out of storage, the heat coming from each rod has dwindled to about 25 watts, roughly equivalent to the warmth from a small electric light bulb. About 200 rods at a time are loaded underwater into an open-topped steel skip, which is then placed inside a special container called a flask for transport to Sellafield by road and rail. On March the 6th, 1984, phase one of the program was carried out. An actual flask, straight off the production line, was filled with water and loaded with steel bars to simulate fuel elements. It was hoisted over nine meters into the air and then dropped. The flask was dropped on one edge of the lid to impose the severest possible test of its integrity. In dynamic terms, as far as forces on the flask are concerned, the event was all over in about 20 thousandths of a second. In that split second, the projecting parts of the lid were knocked back and the lid moved momentarily away from the body. Some of the bolts stretched slightly. It all happened so quickly that the flexible seals between lid and body could not readjust fast enough. And as a result, a tiny amount of water escaped in the form of an atomized spray. The quantity of water which escaped would, in real life, have had no radiological significance at all and posed no health hazard. But dropping the flask wasn't enough, in the opinion of some MPs and local authorities consulted. Only a full-scale rail crash would really prove the point. So, in July 1984, Operation Smash Hit was arranged. The same flask used in the drop test was fitted with a new lid, filled with a ton of water and 200 steel bars, once again to simulate uranium fuel rods, festooned with measuring instruments and mounted on a flat roll, the kind of wagon used for transporting operational flasks. This was then derailed and turned on its side on a stretch of test track at Old Dalby in Leicestershire, as if it were a real accident. A Type 46 diesel locomotive, number 46009, and three standard coaches were used to represent a typical passenger train. Dynamically speaking, more coaches would have made no difference to the force of the impact. On Tuesday, July the 17th, these were positioned eight and three-quarter miles back from Old Dalby, near a village called Edwalton. The train was set in motion without a driver. Every inch of the journey was followed by cameras mounted in a helicopter, and the train's speed was checked by engineers using radar guns. Eventually, it reached 100 miles an hour. And watched from a safe distance by some 1,500 invited guests, it ploughed headlong into the derailed flask and wagon. Thirty-two different cameras captured the scene from many different angles.
There was even a camera on the front of the engine. But whichever way you looked at it, it was a tremendous test of the strength of the fuel flask. The draw hook on the front of the locomotive hit the edge of the flask, but the lid stayed bolted in position. There was some scarring of the steel and buckling of the outside cooling fins. But the flask had been pressurised to 6.9 bar before the test, and measurements taken afterwards showed that only 0.02 bar of pressure had been lost, proof that it had remained intact and totally safe for the public had it contained actual radioactive materials. Seeing that high-speed film made me remember the birth of high-speed photography in the Manhattan Project. Early atomic weapons use focused explosives as a ball around the plutonium core. It was vital for scientists to see how that core imploded, and the only way to do it was to record the explosion at very high speeds. Some of the imagery is amazing, and the people who made the cameras are fascinating. In a remarkable laboratory at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, time and motion are dramatically dissected. With the aid of a pulsating strobe light, Dr. Harold Edgerton can freeze a flurry of movement onto a single plate of film. Dr. Edgerton developed the strobe light in 1931. Unable to see how electric motors behaved when they rotated at various speeds, he designed a light which could flash so quickly and brightly that motion seemed to stop. A world expert on high-speed photography, Edgerton delights in demonstrating the amazing power of camera and light. Now, we're going to uh, do an experiment here to take a picture of a bullet, a very high-velocity bullet, as it cuts this playing card in two. The playing card will be attached to this tape. The bullet will come out of the gun at 2,800 feet per second. It, if we aim it correctly, it'll cut through the card. And we want to turn on a light, a very special strobe light, that lasts less than a millionth of a second in order to stop the bullet effectively on the film, make a sharp, clear uh, photograph. The sound of the bullet will trigger the strobe light, which creates an image on film. A first shot will test Dr. Edgerton's aim. Here we go. Now, the event as the strobe light reveals it. Less than a millionth of a second is permanently frozen in time. Another striking example of the strobe's revealing power is what Edgerton calls making applesauce. Perhaps the most dramatic of Dr. Edgerton's visual techniques combines the powerful strobe light with a high-speed motion picture camera. There you go. All set. Three, two, one, shoot! Paul from Curious Droid Channel did a fantastic job at explaining how these cameras worked. Here's an extract from his film. During the Manhattan Project to develop the first atomic bomb, they required cameras that could record the first few microseconds of the explosion. In order to create a nuclear chain reaction and achieve critical mass, a baseball-sized piece of plutonium had to be compressed to about half its size. 
This was achieved by using an array of focused high explosive lenses surrounding the plutonium core. In order to make it work effectively, the explosives, 32 of them in all, had to be triggered within one microsecond. If any were delayed, then the compression of the core would be unequal and the reaction would either be much less or may not even happen at all. Using a super high speed camera, it would be possible to see how effective the explosive lenses had been just a few microseconds after detonation. At the time, the fastest cameras were Fastex Cine cameras and could achieve around 10,000 frames per second or one frame per 100 microseconds. This still wasn't fast enough though. The first high-speed rotating mirror camera was the Marley, invented by the British physicist William Gregory Marley. The Marley camera used a rotating mirror and an array of lenses inside a curved housing, each focused onto a single piece of film around the edge of the case. This could record a sequence of up to 50 images onto 35mm film at 100,000 frames per second. But by the time of a Trinity test, it was outdated and too slow to record the ultra quick reaction in the plutonium core. Head of the photography unit, Julian Mack, said that the fixed short focus and low quality of the lenses would probably have made the Mali camera pictures useless. He helped develop the Mack Streak camera, which had a 10 million frame per second limit. That's one frame every 100 nanoseconds. By the 1950s, Harold Egerton had developed the Rapatronic camera, the name coming from Rapid Action Electronic. This used a magneto-optic shutter, which allowed it to have an exposure time as short as 10 nanoseconds. That's 10 billionths of a second. This was first used for the hydrogen bomb test of the Eniwetok Atoll in 1952. However, they only took one image. So to see the first few microseconds of a nuclear detonation, up to 10 were used in sequence with an average exposure time of three microseconds. The images were then played back and blended together to give the impression of a film. These amazing images were taken during some of the earliest nuclear tests. You can see the segments of the explosive lenses. The spiky things sticking out of the ball are the guy wires from the tower turned into plasma. When the first atomic bomb was exploded, scientists were terrified that it would produce a chain reaction in the whole of the Earth's atmosphere. This hellish thought also made people see things in the explosions. I don't know how real these images are, but they apparently show a devilish figure that has been unleashed. Today, we can buy high-speed cameras, and it's beautiful to see bees' wings and flowers unfolding. But of course, most of them are American, so the real test is to shoot things.
all reveals the hidden beauty of the real world and as we know the truth is out there. Thank <laughs> you.